right. I cannot emphasize enough how important what we are about to talk about is. These are the macromolecules. They are large organic molecules, meaning they're carbon containing. That's all the organic means. And they make up all living things. We cannot live without these four molecules. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. They literally run your body. They hold the information at to how to run your, for how to run your body, and they provide the energy to do so. They do everything. I'm not exaggerating when I say every single thing we will learn for the rest of this semester is going to relate back to these four molecules. So please commit this to memory and make it a game to see how many times you can hear about them again and point out the connections for the rest of the semester because they're going to keep coming up. We are going to go through each one of these four and we are going to talk about their structure and their functions, where we find them, their, um, how if they do provide us energy. So before we jump in to each one, I want you to understand structurally how they work. Most of these um, biological molecules are polymers that are made out of monomers. So what does that mean? Monomers are small, basic subunits. Polymers are larger, more complex structures made of monomers. Think about the monomer like a brick that builds into the polymer, which is a brick wall. Or a monomer is like a word, and we build words into a sentence, which would be like the polymer. Here is an example of an actual macromolecule of um, a nucleic acid called DNA, which we'll learn so much about. But you can see this is the monomer. It's called a nucleotide and how it builds in, you can see the different nucleotides that are making up the DNA. So small subunits are the monomers, they build into the polymers, the larger structures. So how do we make polymers from monomers? It's called a dehydration reaction, or um, some textbooks refer to it as a dehydration synthesis reaction. It builds a polymer by linking together monomers, and it does that by removing a water molecule. And this happens when, um, one of the times this happens is when your body has more glucose than it needs. Glucose is um, fuel for your cells. It'll combine excess glucose molecules and store them as glycogen, which is a more complex carbohydrate, and so that you can use them later when needed. So let's look at this simple diagram of this reaction. You have two different monomers here, one monomer and another. Both of them have um, hydroxyl groups on the end here. Monomer one, monomer two. We're going to pull out the OH from one and the H from another, and that gives us H2O. So we're removing water, and then that allows this oxygen molecule and to bond these two monomers together, and that's where we get one polymer. Okay, so we remove water to bind them together. If we want to break polymers up into monomers, we do a hyd hydrolysis reaction. Hydro means water, Lysis means to split or break apart. So we're going to break big polymers into smaller monomers. We do this by adding water, which breaks the bond. Okay, so this will happen. One example of this is in your digestive system. As enzymes are trying to break down um, complex starches into simpler sugars, they are going to um, do this by adding water. So we have our polymer here. We're going to add water, and it's going to break it into the monomer, the two different monomers. Okay, so let's talk about each one of these four essential molecules for life. First, let's talk about carbohydrates. Um, they're in all sorts of things. Their main function is energy storage, specifically short term. I like to think of them as your easy to access energy source. But they do lots of other things too. They have structural purposes, they transport, and they have a key role in signaling. We find them in sugars and starches, and not just sugars like you think of in this picture, but sugars that make up fruits and starches and stuff that make up vegetables. They're, when people say, I'm cutting out all carbs, they usually don't mean it. They usually just mean unhealthy um, carbohydrates, but not all carbs, because carbs are in so many things, and we need carbs. If you think back to concept two, when we talked about the six essential elements for life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, 
We'll talk about which ones compose each of these four molecules, but carbs are just made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's it. Very simple. Just three elements that make such an important molecule or such important molecules. All right, their structure. The monomer, so the simple basic subunit, are single sugar molecules called monosaccharides, so mono and mono. So here's an example of a single sugar molecule. Notice that it is a single ring here of carbons, and then you have all these hydrogen and oxygens off of them. Examples are glucose, which is the main fuel for the cell. It's made by plants in photosynthesis, and we break it down during cellular respiration to get energy in a form that our cells can use. Galactose is a single sugar molecule in milk, and fructose is in fruit. These carbon rings that are make up these single sugar molecules link together into these chains, and that's what we see in a polymer, which is a polysaccharide, or a larger sugar molecules. Examples are starches, which is how plants store sugar, glycogen, which is how animals like us do it, and then cellulose, which is a structural support in plant cell walls. In terms of energy storage, carbs store four calories of energy per gram. Now this doesn't mean anything really right now, but it's going to make more sense as we compare the four macromolecules to each other in terms of energy. Your body can access and break down carbs really easily. Thus, it is typically the first thing your body will break down to get energy when you need it. It's going to, carbs are going to be its go-to source. All right, next are the lipids. Their main function is also energy storage, but long-term. We also use them for insulation, protection, and sugar. When you, or excuse me, structure, not sugar. When you think of lipids, um, you're, we most often think of fats and oils in terms of the foods we eat, and that is true. But they're also found in just some different lipid um, formats in your body, like phospholipids, which are in the cell membrane, and steroids. Lipids are like carbs, and they're just made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's it. It's so not a crazy complex structure. They're monomer. There's no true monomer for lipids. Um because some they just there's a, a little bit of variety there but in general we tend to think of fatty acids as the monomer which are basically just chains of carbons with hydrogens on them and then which would this is just one fatty acid right here chain the polymer are triglycerides so three fatty acid chains and glycerols um, stuck together makes up a triglyceride energy storage nine calories per gram they store almost twice as, or over twice as much energy per gram as carbohydrates. That's huge. But they're not as easy to access. So when your body is, is going to go for the carbs first, when it runs out of those, then it's going to go for the lipids next in terms of energy. All right, I wanted to highlight a special lipid that's going to come up a lot in our next unit on cells, and that is a phospholipid. So phosphate and a lipid. It's two fatty acids that we can see simplified in this diagram here. If I can get my mouse up, there it is. Two fatty acid chains and a phosphate group. We call this part the head. So here's what it looks like if you actually break down the structure more. This is just like a clip art diagram of it. The head is hydrophilic, which if you remember from chemistry of life concept two, water loving or water affinity. And that's the phosphate group. And then the tails are hydrophobic. They are afraid of water or water hating. And this is really important because phospholipids organize themselves into this two layers that make up the cell membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer, two layers of these phospholipids. That makes up the structure of the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, which is just the skin of our cells. So you cut a cell in half, this is what it looks like in terms of how the membrane is structured. And the reason this is so important is the organization of these phospholipids with their hydrophilic heads on the outside and then the hydrophobic tails on the inside is it makes the cell membrane selectively permeable, which is just a fancy way of saying that the cell membrane is very picky about what it lets come in and out of the cell. And that is important because that is how your cell is able to maintain homeostasis or constant and stable internal conditions. It has to happen on a cellular level so that it can happen on an organism level and you as a whole can stay healthy and everything be functioning correctly. 
So we're going to talk about this so much more in the next unit, especially because there's a lot of other stuff that goes on in this structure than what's pictured here. But I just want to introduce it because, again, these themes and these molecules are going to come up over and over and over again. All right, next, it might be my favorite. They are so important and so underrated. They are proteins. Proteins are so much more than just for muscle building. I'm telling you that right now, so get that out of your head. They are the most diverse and most abundant macromolecules. They make up over half of our cell's biomass. And they don't even have one main function because they do so much. They literally run your body. When if you're not sure, um, you know, oh, like, what is this function? Is it for a carb or lipid? It's probably for a protein because they do so much. So we're going to go through a lot. They're enzymes that control the rate of biochemical reactions. We'll talk about that in Unit 3, Energy Flow. Hormones that help regulate our cell processes, like insulin, which helps regulate our blood sugar. Structurally, like most of us think of them, they make up bones and muscles, so think of collagen. Transport. They help transport substances in and out of a cell. Hemoglobin is a super important protein that helps transport oxygen to cells that need it. Proteins are antibodies that help our immune system fight diseases. They help make it possible for us to move. We have these contractile proteins that allow um, for movement. They are receptors that sit on the cell membrane and within the cell in order to receive signals and then transport those messages so our body knows what to do. We'll talk about that when we talk about pathogens at the end of the year in my class. And then they are also a source of energy in the food we eat. So you can find proteins in meats and nuts and um, legumes and dairy products, but a lot are just made by your body also. They are made of all six of the essential elements for life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Their monomer is amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids, and those amino acids organize themselves into these polypeptide chains. So think of each one of these circles as an amino acid. They're linked together by peptide bonds, and we'll learn about the process of synthesizing a protein in Unit 4 Genetics. But they link into these, and the order of them determines so much. We'll talk about the structure more in a second. But the polymer is called a polypeptide because you have many peptide bonds that hold those amino acids together. Their energy storage is 4 calories per gram, just like carbohydrates. But proteins do so many other things for our body other than energy, that they're a last resort. They're not going to be your body's go-to source. We're going to go and break those down after we've broken down carbs and lipids. And so that's really important. Last thing I want to talk about in terms of proteins, especially if you go on and take AP Biology, you will get, if you're in my AP Bio class, we'll get into the structure so much more, but is the importance of folding. Like I said before, proteins are the most diverse macromolecule in terms of their structure and function. They have four levels to their structure. So primary structure is like this. It's just the sequence of amino acid. So the order that the amino acids are put in. And we'll learn about that again, like I said, in unit four. Then there's the secondary structure. This is where that, that polypeptide chain of amino acids is gonna either twist into an alpha helix or it's gonna become this kind of pleated beta sheet is what it's called. The next level is tertiary structure, which we see here. That polypeptide chain gets bent and folded into a three-dimensional structure. And there's all sorts of little bonds happening in here and um, interactions that make this shape possible. And then last is the quaternary structure. This is where two or more polypeptide chains are bound together to form this really complex structure. And the reason I want to show you this amount of detail about how proteins get all folded up is because form dictates function. This is a major theme of biology, but it's, it's honestly the main theme of my anatomy and physiology course. This idea that the shape of the protein or the shape of just anything determines what it is then able to do. And this understanding the complexity of a protein structure is so important because because there's so much variations that can happen, so many variations that can happen, that's why there's able to be so many functions. And proteins are able to do so much because we can shape them in so many different ways. This is also really important. 
when we get to unit five, heredity, and we talk about mutations and how if some part of this shape gets messed up, then there can be issues because the shape determines what it can do. And so it may not be able to do what it was initially intended to do. So a little preview of what is to come, which there will be a lot more about proteins, I can promise you. And last, but most definitely not least, because we spent about two complete units talking about them later on, are the nucleic acids. Their main function, they are informational molecules. So not energy storage molecules like we think of carbs and lipids, and not run your body molecules like proteins, but they're the informational ones. They store, transmit, and express our genetic information. They have the instructions for making proteins that run your body. So essentially, the instructions for making you who you are are in your nucleic acids. They're found in DNA and RNA, deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. And what I think is the most fascinating is there's no pictures of food here because we don't get our DNA from the food we eat. We get it from our parents. You are made, 50% of, of your DNA came from your biological father's sperm and the other half came from your biological mother's egg. That is where the DNA that makes you up came from. Um, in terms of the elements that compose it, it's everything but sulfur. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Okay, monomer and polymer. The monomer of a nucleic acid is a nucleotide like we see pictured here. There are five of those, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and uracil. I bolded the first letter though because we often just refer to them as a GTCU. A nucleotide has three components, a five carbon sugar, either deoxyribose or ribose, a phosphate group, and then a nitrogenous base or a nitrogen containing base. This base is what determines whether it's going to be the A, the G, the T, the C, or the U. It's polymer. These nucleotides build into the, just a nucleic acid. That's the polymer. That's it, which is either DNA or RNA. DNA is pictured here. It's a double helix, um, and RNA is just a single strand. And again, we'll talk more about this later in Unit 4. Last but not least, energy storage. Zero. There is no energy stored in our nucleic acid, so we will never, ever, ever break them down as a source for energy. That is so important. All right, I know that was a lot, and it was just a lot of what seems like random facts right now, but we have to commit them to memory because they're going to become more meaningful as we dive deeper into our content this year. So we're going to stop in class and make a little foldable now to organize all this information to help you study it.